<clears throat> Good morning, GCDC. I uh, want to thank you guys for tuning in to our Foundation of the Kingdom this morning. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, this first start, uh, hopefully, of your day. Uh, that God will bless you to uh, be with us uh, as we talk about a huge topic, um, an area uh, that sometimes in the kingdom of God we don't discuss, uh, and sometimes we uh, are ignorant or just uh, not knowledgeable regarding the aspect of there being an unforgivable sin that's talked about in the Bible, uh, that both Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, these gospel writers, are going to tell us uh, what this unforgivable sin is. Uh, and so today is a day uh, of how God will bless with a level of warning, a level of instruction, a level of giving us the ability to uh, have a greater understanding and comprehension of how it is that we are to guard our tongues, uh, things that we are not ever supposed to say. Uh, because once these words come out of our mouths and we don't have the ability uh, to retract, we don't have the ability to be pardoned, we don't have the ability to be forgiven, uh, for these particular things that could be said. And so I will give this caveat in the very beginning uh, that this teaching uh, is a warning that God will bless us to receive. And I'll be very clear uh, not to, even in examples, uh, that potentially could be given to say something that would be deemed to be a violation of this unforgivable sin. Uh, and so what I'm going to do before we get started is to uh, ask us to bow our heads, close our eyes, uh, and we'll have a word of prayer uh, before we get into uh, some definitions and uh, actually the three areas in the Gospels where uh, this unforgivable sin is clearly uh, discussed. So if we could bow our heads, close our eyes, and go to the throne of God together. Father God, we come right now uh, giving you praise, honor, and glory, thanking you for blessing us with this day. But God, also thank you for blessing us with this teaching. God, that there are areas in our lives where uh, sometimes we become very comfortable with things that are blasphemous, things that are injurious that we could say out of our mouths. And Father, I ask right now that you bless each of us to have ears to hear, a heart to receive, and a mind to understand what you will bless us to receive today. Father, that when you give us warning, it's meant for us to be warned for us to understand, uh, God, that you are a God of holiness, that you are a God of righteousness, that there are things that you want your people to do, and there are things, God, that you do not want us to do. And in this regard, God, I ask right now that your Holy Spirit fall fresh in this teaching and that you bless this, your son and teacher, to hide me behind the cross of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, God, and teach this word with power and warning and conviction as only you can. God bless the Holy Spirit to touch us, each of us, when we see this in a way that reminds us that there are consequences for our actions, but God, to keep us far from this unforgivable sin. So God bless every person that will watch in whatever capacity um, that they are, and God bless this word, this teaching, to touch your people in the depths of our spirits where we need you the most. We ask all these and other blessings in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. And so today, as we look at the unforgivable sin in Matthew 12, verses 31 to 32, before we get there, I wanna look at uh, the definition of unforgivable. And so the definition of unforgivable, it seems pretty basic, but I wanna break this down so you have a greater understanding. That the word unforgivable means to be so bad as to be unable to be forgiven, excused, or pardoned. And so we have a God, a Father, who is a forgiving God. We uh, base a lot of our relational connection with him on the aspects of forgiveness that he will give to his children when we do wrong, when we sin, when we do things that are counter to him. But he says very clearly that there's an aspect in our lives that I pray we never conduct or act upon where we do something that the Bible says is unforgivable. It's unable to be forgiven. God tells us that the basis of our relationship with him and forgiveness from him is when we have the ability to forgive others for the things that they have done to us, then God very clearly will forgive us for the things that we have done to others and the things that we have sinned and done against him and his word and his will and his way. And so, 
it's very clear that God wants us to be forgiving as he forgives us. He tells us very clearly that, you know, we are to forgive others um, as God forgives us, you know, and that we are to be in right relationship with him through the forgiveness that we extend to other people. We also must forgive ourselves. But if there's a situation where you could do something that is unforgivable by God, not people, but by God, that is inexcusable or unexcusable behavior, that there's times in our lives where we ask for, and this is huge, we, we ask for to be excused. You know, if you were a child and you were at the dinner table and you asked to be excused, that means that you could get up and you could leave. Um, if you were at a job and you needed to have an excused absence and you were at a funeral or, you know, um, at the doctor's office or something along those lines, they would ask you for a note and you would be able to be deemed to be excused from work that day because you got that note and God blessed and you got the note from the funeral director or the doctor and you hand it in to your job and they said, you have an excused absence, which means that you were absent and we excused you from work that day because you had a valid reason or you were a person who was imprisoned uh, for a number of years and you were seeking to be pardoned by the governor or the president and so you were looking for a presidential pardon or governor's pardon to be able to release you from your bondage, release you from your prison sentence. And so you would seek to be pardoned. And if they issued that pardon, you would get out right when they gave you the pardon for your actions. But God is gonna tell us very clearly that there's an unforgivable sin that you won't be forgiven for, that you won't be excused for, that you won't be pardoned for. And so we need to realize that when God speaks to us inside the household of faith, inside the kingdom as believers, that we need to hear and adhere to this warning. That this is a teaching on warning. And sometimes we can get so comfortable with the things that we say that are blasphemous against God, blasphemous against Christ, that we could lead ourselves down a path where we get to this unforgivable sin and we commit it because we've been blasphemous to the Holy Spirit as well. And so what I want us to do quickly is to look at this other definition, which is a Greek word called blasphemia. And blasphemia, <clears throat> we know as blasphemy, um, has two parts to it, and we'll break down each part as God blesses. So the first part of blasphemy or blasphemia is slander, detraction, speech injurious to another's good name. And so slander is speech that's spoken, things that are said that are negative to individuals. It's not something that's written. Libel is, uh, uh, libel is something that's written, and slander is something that's spoken. And so slander is negative comments, negative statements made regarding a person when you know that they are false, that they are untrue, uh, and they are meant to injure the individual's good name and reputation. And so slander is actually uh, of something that you could sue for in a court of law uh, from a civil perspective, where an individual could actually go to a judge and say, I'm suing, suing this individual for slander. They've said things that are totally false. They've tried to represent that these things are true, and they're totally false, they're totally um, untrue, uh, and as a result, it's having a negative impact upon me in whatever way. It could be that you've slandered someone's good name and now they can't get a job, or you've slandered someone's good name and they lost the job uh, that they had. Whatever it is, uh, slander is something that's spoken, and it's meant to injure the person's good name. And so there's an aspect even in that where God wants us to be very clear that our tongue is, uh, we sometimes use it as a weapon. And the Bible tells us that there's power in the tongue. Um, it tells us very clearly that, you know, that there is life and death in the tongue. And they who love it shall uh, eat the fruit thereof. And so as a result, our tongue can be used as a weapon sometimes to injure other people. And there's times in our lives where individuals have told us when we were young, you know, sticks and stones may break our bones, but words will never hurt us. And so you don't want words to hurt. You don't want words to injure. You don't want to say things that are painful to individuals. Um, 
that may hurt them in a way where it wounds them for longer periods of time than even flesh wounds or things that can happen to their bodies. But the interesting thing about it is that when we start dealing with the tongue and speech, what you say out of your mouth comes from what's in your heart. And the aspects of what's in your heart influence and impact what your mind thinks, how you look at situations. And so you can wind up from the aspects of um, blackness or negative aspects in your heart and an untransformed mind. That's why God says that our mind needs to be transformed by Jesus Christ and we're to bring every thought under the power and direction of our Lord Jesus Christ that you could say certain things or think certain things or feel or have an emotional reaction to certain things that could be injurious when it comes out of your mouth because I want you to think about something. The speech, the things that you say are translated through your mind. Your mind starts to formulate the words that you're going to say and sometimes we allow our emotions then to govern what our mind thinks and then our mind tells our tongue what to say. Rather than guarding our heart, which would allow us to have the ability to be able to be calm in a negative situation, which then would allow our mind to not think the way that our mind does, but to think in the way that Christ wants our mind to think, which then would allow us to not say the thing that could potentially be slanderous or speech that's injurious to another's good name. And so you can't guard against the slander. You know, a person that wants to say what they're going to say, and we have this thing in the United States where we talk about and try to protect free speech and all the rest of that, and God said that all speech ain't free. You can say to yourself that all speech is free, but if you speak this, it comes with a great consequence. If you ever say this against the Holy Spirit, and you blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So it says here, it says, in part two, it says it's impious and reproachful speech injurious to divine majesty. So in the first part, we're talking about another's good name, and that could be the good name of the Father, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the good name of the Holy Spirit. So it could be an individual that you're speaking against the good name of another person who's done good things. The, things about, the thing about blasphemy is that you have to have done something good, first of all. You have to have a good name, first of all, in order for blasphemy to actually be a charge. If you're somebody that's out here doing dirt, and somebody out that's out here very negative and you're saying stuff and doing stuff and they just are speaking fact, it's not blasphemy. It's just fact. If you're doing these sinful negative things and that's, what been, that's what's been pointed out, it's not blasphemy, it's not slander, it's fact. But when you're doing good and someone tries to tear you down, you need to realize that this part two is impious and reproachful speech. That means that you are saying things that are unholy, you're impious, um, you're reproachful, you're saying things that are counter to God, sinful, and the things that come out of your mouth. I got to say this too, as God blesses. It's very interesting that, you know, God says very clearly in what we're going to talk about that there's something that you should never say. Now, he is the creator of all things and he's the creator of us. And so as a result, why would we ever say anything against our creator in any way, shape, or form? Why would we ever speak things into existence or to say things out of our mouth that would be counter to our creator? the person who gives us life. Then the individuals who brought us into the world, our father and our mother are an aspect of who we say gave us physical life, but our spiritual, the aspect of our soul, the aspect of our eternal existence can only come from God. And so why would you say something? I just want to put, put this out there. Why would you ever say something counter to the creator who created you, who knew you before you were ever put into your mother's womb, who has good plans for you and things of that nature and says that he wants to be with you for all of eternity, why would you ever even think to formulate something out of your mouth that might be counter to him or the three parts of who he is, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? But we could get to a place where we become too comfortable with acting like the world. And so as a result, we wind up finding ourselves on this path where we could do something that's unforgivable to God. <coughs> so I want us to look here as God blesses as well. So this impious and reproachful speech injurious to divine majesty, we have to be very clear that we are not doing or saying things that put us on the path of where we could have speech that's injurious to divine majesty, where you are challenging the divine majesty of God. That you are putting yourself in a position where you are not reverentially fearful of taking the name of the Lord in vain. So, so we'll deal with a couple things quickly 
where when you take the name of the Lord in vain, you take the name of Christ in vain, um, that leads you down a path of blasphemia or blasphemy. Um, and sometimes we don't even realize it. So you've, you've uh, stubbed your toe or done something where you suffer some level of injury and you say the name Jesus Christ with exclamation and all the rest of that. And you're not asking for prayer. You're using it almost in like a swearing kind of way. And there's individuals who've done this uh, and you need to make sure that you give warning to those individuals when they have taken the name of Jesus Christ or the Father in vain. You will say to yourself that God can't do this, can't do that. That speech that's injurious to his good name. His name is good because he is good. Therefore, there's nothing that you could say against God to where you could say that he's bad in any kind of way. Um, even when we go through bad times, God is still good. And so as a result, his name will always be good. But you have individuals who feel that they could say what they want when they want. Well, you can say what you want when you want because then you will suffer the consequences and eat the fruit of what comes out of your mouth. But for us as believers, we need to realize and understand that we should never blaspheme against the Father. We should never give speech that's injurious to the name of Jesus Christ or to the divine majesty of Christ, that you would say to yourselves, I mean, there were times in the Bible where the Sadducees and Pharisees deemed Jesus to be blasphemous because he was saying that he was one with the Father and that when they saw Jesus, that they saw the Father and they thought that that was blasphemous. But these were individuals who had created rules and regulations that were counter to Almighty God and they were putting things on people that God would never put on them and they refused to believe in the good name of Jesus Christ. They refuse to receive the divine majesty of Christ. And so as a result, the very individuals who were calling Jesus a blasphemer were blaspheming themselves because they refused to recognize. They refused to acknowledge. They refused to believe in the divine majesty of Christ. And so we have individuals, atheists and others, who, you know, detract and say that God isn't God and and that we came from some big bang and all the rest of this kind of stuff and science over, over, over spirituality and all these other things. And so as a result, there's an account that all of us have to give of the words and the things that we say uh, because we have to give account to God in judgment uh, for the things that we have done here on this earth. And so blaspheming and being uh, blasphemous is something that we should never do. It's something that we pray that God uh, eliminates in our lives, just as he has eliminated sin through the blood of Jesus Christ. We don't want to blaspheme against anything related to God, any aspect of the nature of God, any aspect of his name, any aspect of Jesus Christ, and especially any aspect of the Holy Spirit, who is sent back by God to inhabit his temples, to inhabit his people, to give us guidance and direction. And so we're going to see in our verses as God will bless. And we'll look here at the first, uh, here in Matthew 12, 31 to 32, where it says, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. So I believe scripture is very clear, that it tells us very simply what it is that it wants us to have warning regarding. It says that if you sin against the Father, if you sin against the Son, and we'll see this in the next verse, but it says every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven except what blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will what? Never be forgiven. So let's break this down for just a second. So every sin can be forgiven. Every blasphemy can be forgiven but there's an exception. So you lead yourself down the path of where you say, I've said this against the Father and I ask for forgiveness, he'll forgive you. I blasphemed against God and I've asked him for forgiveness and he'll forgive you. I blasphemed against, the, against Jesus Christ, the Son, and I've sinned against Christ, the Son, and I can be forgiven. Now, I shouldn't even be getting into those spaces where I'm blaspheming and sinning against the Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. But it says here that there's an exception that I want you to realize. That there's two parts of the triune being that you could think that you could blaspheme and sin against and you could be forgiven. However, the last aspect, the aspect of who God sent back to this earth in order to be a blessing to give us direction, to be our paraclete, to be our guide, to be the one that will help us in times of trouble and need. Uh, that's to be the inhabitant of the holy, of our temple, which is to be holy. 
If you blaspheme and say speech that's injurious to the Holy Spirit, speech that's counter to the Holy Spirit's good name, speech that's uh, against the divine majesty of the Holy Spirit, then you won't be forgiven. That there's no way for you to ask for forgiveness. Because watch this, this is huge. So you've asked for forgiveness regarding the Father, and he's forgiven you. You've asked for forgiveness regarding the Son, and he's forgiven you. But you've asked now, after you've said this blasphemous statement against the Holy Spirit, and now you're seeking to be forgiven, I want you to think about something. You know, there's a such thing in baseball that three strikes and you're out. You shouldn't even have the first two strikes. You shouldn't say what you said in the beginning. If you've gotten so comfortable saying what you said that now you've tried to say something and I'm going to be very guarded in my speech because I don't want to be put in that position. I want you to realize and understand that for those of us that believe that the word of God is the inerrant without air aspect of what God speaks to his people, you have to be very careful even in your teaching. There will be an example that will be biblical, and I'll use that example as it relates to blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. I've given you some examples of where individuals might blaspheme against the Father and the Son, and you could ask for forgiveness, but I would tell you don't do that. Don't have strike one or strike two, because it'll lead to strike three, and then at strike three, you're out, which will never be forgiven. So the God of forgiveness says that there is a, an aspect of your relational connection with him where you could never be forgiven. So why would you ever want to copycat the world and say something that would be counter? So watch what happens here in verse 32. It says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, as we just talked about. But anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit, watch this, will never be forgiven, either in this world or where in the world to come. So there's only two existences that you're going to have. There's your existence here on this earth, which is numbered by a number of days that God already knows. And then there's your eternal existence in the world to come. So it says here that you will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. So we have the believers who think once saved, always saved. And then you feel that you could say something blasphemous against the Holy Spirit. This doesn't say that. It says that you will never be forgiven by God for the thing that you have said. And so it says anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. So you have to be guarded in what it is that you even say as it relates to Jesus Christ. And then when you've said something, you need to ask for forgiveness. But my admonition to each and every one of you will be, and to myself as well, don't even say that. Don't say the thing that's counter to God. Don't say the thing that's counter to Christ. Be very careful and guarded in what it is that you are going to have come out of your mouth. Because if, if it's deemed to be blasphemous against the Father, if it's deemed to be blasphemous against the Holy Spirit, I mean against Jesus Christ, you may be able to be forgiven. But if it's blasphemous against the Holy Spirit, God does not forgive you for that. He doesn't forgive you in this world. And he doesn't forgive you, watch this, in the world to come. That means that your eternal existence and the consequences upon you saying something on this side can have an eternal consequence to what occurs for you or to you after you pass. So now you've doomed yourself because you were careless with your speech. You, it tells us that we are supposed to be, you know, slow to anger, quick to listen, you know, um, things of that nature. And there's times in our lives when we allow our emotions to, to, to guard or to govern what it is that comes out of our mouth and the things that we say, not understanding that our tongue, when used as a weapon, wounds and sometimes causes wounds that take much longer to heal than a broken bone or a cut on your body or things of that nature. But what God is saying here is that you've been so reckless with your speech because it says here, but anyone who speaks again, so watch this, this is huge. So you formulated this aspect in your heart where you don't believe in God for whatever your reasons are, or you've had negative experiences and you want to give an account and say that that's all due to God. He put me through this, and so as a result, I'm going to say this negative thing against him, and then I'm going to speak against the, the Jesus Christ, the Son, who saved me, who gave his life for me when I was yet a sinner out here doing all kind of negative stuff that was self-destructive and putting myself in a position where, you know, I, I was probably on the road to the other place, definitely not to heaven, that he saw fit to give his life for me, which is an individual relationship. And so he does that, and I would have the audacity to say something counter to him. 
But because I've gotten so comfortable, now I put myself in a position where I could speak against the Holy Spirit. I could say that the Holy Spirit, you know, doesn't have the power that the Holy Spirit has. Well, that could be deemed to be a blasphemous statement. And as a result, you don't ever want to say anything that could never be forgiven because you're talking against the Holy Spirit. And so that can't be forgiven. Now, this is a warning. Don't ever do that, either in this world or in the world to come, because what happens is, is if you speak against the Holy Spirit in, on this side, you've doomed yourself. Why? Because you won't be forgiven in this world or in the world to come. So that means that there's an eternal consequence to the words sometimes that we speak, and we don't tell people that there's an eternal consequence. So stop saying, stop walking down the road to where you could even be a believer and have this eternal consequence. That's counter to God wanting you to be eternally with him. Your speech has now kept you out of right relationship with him, and it won't be forgiven. And so let's get here now to Luke 12 and 10. Now, we just dealt with Matthew. In Luke 12 and 10, he's going to tell us almost the exact same thing. Luke is going to tell us here in 10, it says, Anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit, now watch this, will not be forgiven. Now, Matthew just told us this, and Luke now doubles down on the exact same thing that Matthew just told us. So I want you to think about something quickly, that as God blesses that two of the gospel writers, and we'll look at um, Mark in conclusion, but two of the gospel writers now have indicated to us that there is an aspect of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that will never be forgiven, that will not be forgiven. It doesn't tell us, and I love when the Bible blesses in ways for you to be able to interpret and to see that which is not said as well as that which is said. It doesn't give you any level of instruction on how you can repent against or repent for blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. There's no repentance that you could do in this regard. Because it says that anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. This doesn't lead you. The first one says that there's a level of repentance. In verse 10, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, which means that there's an aspect of repentance. There's an aspect of forgiveness that the Father and the Son will provide to that individual who then repents and asks for forgiveness from Almighty God, asks for forgiveness for Jesus Christ for what it is that they said. But anyone who blasphemes, says speech that's injurious to the good name, slanders the Holy Spirit, speaks against the Holy Spirit, speech that's injurious to the divine majesty of the Holy Spirit. Watch this, will not be what? Forgiven. Two-thirds of the divine aspect of the triune God are willing to forgive when you said things that are counter to the Father and the Son. And here it says that it's just really this against the Son of Man can be forgiven. And God will forgive us for those things. But he sends the Holy Spirit back to guide us. At the beginning of every message, I pray that God blesses. And we always ask, whether it be discipleship training or foundation of the kingdom or even a worship service, uh, that we ask the Holy Spirit to come in and to bless, to guide, to saturate the sanctuary and to bless every teaching, to bless every person, to walk with every individual in a way that we know that God is real. And we rely upon the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say and the things that we can't even fathom or think when we are being presented before people or we are saying things to individuals. So I've relied upon that, that the, that the Holy Spirit is, is this aspect of where I can build a dependence upon God. And when I don't know the right words to speak, the Holy Spirit will give me the right words, will give me the unction and direction, or, or take me to the word, to what it is that God wants me to be able to revere or to share. So why would I, for someone that I've become dependent upon, why would I ever say something that would be counter to them? Why would I ever, in what it is that I'm going through, say that the God who created me, who created the tongue that's inside my mouth, who created the heart that beats on the inside of me, who created the mind that blesses me to be able to think, who knew me well before I ever had 
been brought into the physical existence from Willie and Verdale battle that that he knew me in my father's womb I'm in my mother's womb well before I was ever uh, brought into this world and that he had plans for me that are good and not for a disaster to give me a future and a hope and and that these plans that are so great that he has things that he wants me to be able to do in this world and he'll empower me through uh, relational connection with him and through the power of the Holy Spirit that he gave to the people to change our very existence, to give us a life that we couldn't live on our own, that I would ever say something injurious to him. He's done so much that you should always have a good thing to say about God because God is good. So why would you ever say something counter to his good name? Jesus gave his life for you, someone who loves you and cares for you beyond measure, beyond your ability to comprehend and understand. He will never leave us or forsake us. So why would you ever say something negative regarding Christ? And then beyond that, if I don't have anything that I could ever say negative regarding Christ, uh, the Father, uh, Jesus Christ, I mean, the Father, uh, God, Jesus Christ, the Son, and then to get to the point where I would try to separate separate out the Holy Spirit and I say, I'm going to say something negative about the Holy Spirit. That makes no sense to me at all. And the reason that it makes no sense is because as a believer, I believe in the totality of God. First of all, we need to start checking people. We'll run to the last verse in a second, but we need to start checking people because people got some real loose lips as it relates to the Father's name. Now, I got to say that. At this times where real talk, I'm around folk and I try very, <laughs> who he blesses. I try to make sure that I share with them that, you know, as a, not just man of God, but as a child of God, I want to say that in the way that you'll receive it, that there's times in your life that you think that because a person has been called to a position that it changes their relational connection. It gives them greater responsibility, but the relational connection was based upon them first being a child of God, a believer of God. And so I don't want you saying that negative about Willie Battle or Verdale Battle at all. I'll get hot over something like that. But beyond that, there's individuals who say things about God, my father, and claim to be a child. And then you ask yourself, well, why would you say something bad about dad when he didn't done nothing but good for you? Always blessed you. Regardless of what you've gone through, and he can take it. It's not that he can't take the negative things that you say. My question is, is why would you say something negative about somebody that loves you more than you can love yourself? And he'll speak bad against the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. And he'll even still forgive you. Because watch this. This is big. And we'll run to the next verse. Uh, as God blesses. So the people put Jesus on the cross, take him through all the pain and suffering that he goes through, right? And he's on the cross, and he's looking down at these people <clears throat> that he's given his life for. He didn't do anything counter to God. He's without sin. He gave his life for each and every one of us. And then he, he says this conversation to the father, which is huge. He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. So how could someone who forgives you for your ignorance, how could someone who forgives you for the sin that you've committed, that I've committed, that put him on the cross, that required his life to make you or to put you in right relationship with him, how could you say something negative about somebody that has that kind of unconditional love for you and fashion your lips <laughs> to say something counter about his dad who he asked to forgive us right because he knew that watch this he knew that the forgiveness piece was so huge that he had to leave us with that in the last breath that he was taking so we could understand the power of forgiveness because his example was that we still need to forgive others even when they crucify or persecute us. If you're going to walk with Christ, you're going to have people slander your name. If you're going to walk with Christ, you're going to have people do things that are negative. But this is the thing. This is the warning. But don't do that as it relates to the Holy Spirit. Don't ever say something counter. So start with the warning of don't say anything counter regarding the Father. Don't say anything bad regarding Jesus Christ. And then that will not allow you to put yourself in a position where you could have this unforgivable sin. See, pastors can't tell you, repent of what it is that you said because 
It doesn't give you here the aspect for repentance because it says that it won't be forgiven. So we can't give you the task of where, ooh, this is big. Thank you, Father, for this. Many times we use repentance as the way to get back. This is the warning. Don't ever do it to begin with. Don't ever do it. Never let your speech be such that it's injurious, slanderous towards the good name or divine majesty of the Holy Spirit because it will not be forgiven. So let's get here to our last verses. So in Mark 3, 28 to 30, this is the last gospel writer. John uh, doesn't deal specifically with this in the ways that Matthew, Luke, and Mark actually deal with it. But there's an example that's going to be at the end of this that will help us understand, and that's why I wanted to give the biblical example of what uh, this blasphemous statement was in this regard. So in 28 it says, I tell, you, I tell you the truth, all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven, but anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin, watch this, with eternal consequences. Mm. I'm going to read this one more time. 28 says, I tell you the truth. Jesus is the truth. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father but through him. This is big. Love God for this. So since Jesus is the truth and no one can come to the Father but through him, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through him. This is a truthful statement told by Jesus Christ, who is the truth, that will tell you that you could affect your ability to come to the Father through him if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Because it says all sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit, watch this, will never be forgiven. This is a sin with what? Eternal consequences. So stay here. There's a huge piece. You've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You're seeking with all your heart to live according to his good and perfect will. And there are sins that you have committed and you have repented. You've asked God for forgiveness and he has forgiven you. And you've gone back and done it again and he has forgiven you. And you've gone back and done it again and he has forgiven you. And he continues to forgive you because he is a forgiving God. There may be consequences to your sinful behavior, but he continues to forgive you because he wants you in right relationship with him. And then you mess around and you do this thing, speech that's injurious to the good name and divine majesty of the Holy Spirit. And he says, not nope, stop right there. That's one that has an eternal consequence. My son and daughter, that's one that has an eternal consequence. I needed you to be listening. I needed you to hear when he was teaching. I needed you to read those scripture verses. I needed you to understand that that, that one, not that one, that one has an eternal consequence. So don't do it. And there's going to be an example that we'll talk about in just a second that will help us to understand where individuals were doing it, and he called it blasphemous. He called it a blasphemous statement against the Holy Spirit. Because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one. And so for me, to be honest, when I look at it, I would say to myself, well, you shouldn't blaspheme against none of them because they're all one anyway, period. So, but he says here, this aspect, oh, this is huge, and I love God for this, that the aspect of the divine nature of God, the, Trinity, the Trinitarian unity of God, he even spells it out here. So this is where you should believe in the Trinity in and of itself, because he's telling you that if you blaspheme against the Son of Man, you could be forgiven. And who is doing the forgiving? It's the Father. So you have the Father, the Son. But now he says, but don't do that against the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit has been given to us to got us here, to bless us here. And if you do that with the Holy Spirit being present here, residing on the inside of the temples, which is the people, blessing us here with his presence, giving us a sense of power, doing him his power that can only come from the Holy Spirit and God himself through the death and life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He says, don't ever blaspheme. Don't ever use speech that's injurious to the good name and the divine majesty of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because you'll never be forgiven. It's a sin with eternal consequences. So it's one that you can't instruct somebody how to repent from. You can only tell them, don't ever do it. We don't get the opportunity as, as under shepherds to tell you, well, you can repent from this. No, never do it because you don't want to suffer the eternal consequence. Watch this, stay here. There's another piece here quickly that I want to make sure that I share. We tell people all the time, 
Accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You can't get to the Father but through Jesus Christ. And there's only one way to the Father, and that's accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We will tell them that you need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, and you are saved. That's the way to salvation. That's the Romans road. We will instruct people that that is the only way there. This is a sin that you should never commit. We are telling you, be in right relationship with Christ. When you're in right relationship, right relationship with Christ, you can get to the Father, but never do this. And there's times in our lives we need to adhere to the admonishment, to the aspect of the uh, warning that God gives very clearly through Christ in these verses. So watch this last part, as God will bless. In verse 30, it says, he told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. Now, Jesus is having this conversation. He's talking with Sadducees and Pharisees. They are trying to proclaim that Jesus is actually not the son of God, that he's saying things when he's saying the things that he's saying, that, that he is actually being blasphemous in his speech, that what he's saying is impossible for that to actually take place because they believe, they did not believe that Jesus was the son of God. He said that I am the son of God. God, that I am who I am, and as a result, that you need to have a level of belief in Christ to understand that what it is that he's saying is true, and these individuals were saying that he was possessed, watch this, watch this, by an evil spirit. So they were calling the spirit of God evil, and so as a result, that was a blasphemous statement because how could anything of God be evil? And so as a result, they're making this statement, and because they are making this statement, Jesus is still trying to give them a level of admonishment in what it is that they are saying because he wants them to still even have the opportunity. They don't know that they don't know, so Jesus is telling them very definitively that this is something that you should never do. You should never blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus is still yet speaking to them. So as a result, the Holy Spirit has not been given yet. So they have an opportunity to be corrected in their speech. But this is the thing. Their speech is still on the aspects or along the lines of being blasphemous against the Holy Spirit. Because they are thinking that they can say whatever they want to say against Christ Jesus. And so because they got to the place that they thought that they could say whatever they wanted to say, because they got to the place that they thought that they could say things that uh, wouldn't have repercussions for the things that were happening, um, then he wanted to give them a level of admonishment and warning. So I want to read quickly before I get ready to close the aspects of 23 down to 30 in Mark 3. It says, Jesus called them over and responded. And he's talking to these individuals, the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem they were saying that he was possessed by Satan, the prince of demons, that where he gets the power to cast out demons. And they thought that the miracles that he was doing when he entered the house and the crowds began to gather again around him. So I read from verse 20 all the way down. It says, one time Jesus entered the house and the crowds began to gather again. Soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening. They tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. But the teachers of religious law who had arrived from Jerusalem said he's possessed by Satan, the prince of demons. That's where he gets the power to cast out, watch this, demons. And in 23, Jesus called them over and responded with an illustration. How can Satan cast out Satan, he asked. The kingdom divided by civil war will collapse. Similarly, a family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is divided and fights against himself, how can he stand? He would never survive. Let me illustrate this further. Who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man and plunder his goods? Only someone even stronger, someone who could tie him up and then plunder his house. I tell you the truth. All sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. But anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. This is a sin with eternal consequences. He told them this because they were saying he's possessed by an evil spirit. So I want to make sure that I get ready to close with this statement so that way you understand. He gave them warning to give them the level of what their consequences would be if they continued down the path that they were on. He told them that because they were saying to people that he could only do it by the power of Satan. And then he said that, and he was very clear, that Satan, there has to be someone greater than Satan if he could tie up Satan, if he could bind up Satan, if he can go into the house and do something because 
some of the things that the enemy was doing was trying to keep people in bondage and God was healing them through Jesus Christ to be freed of the things that they had been dealing with. And so these individuals, these people, and remember he's talking about the teachers of religious law, he's telling them, you gonna need to stop saying what you're saying because you putting evil and spirit on Jesus. You're saying that I'm possessed by an evil spirit and I have more power than any evil spirit that was cast down by my father from heaven because I was present when the enemy Lucifer was cast down. So as a result, me, the, the father, the son, and the Holy Spirit were all present. We're all one. We were there when creation took place. We were there when things were spoken into existence. So as a result, there's nothing evil about us at all. So you can't put evil and Jesus in the same sentence. But they were saying that he was possessed by an evil spirit, which was a blasphemous statement. Because they're speaking against what? The Holy Spirit in that regard. And he's saying that, listen, I'm about to give you the Holy Spirit and there's nothing on the inside of God. There's nothing on the inside of the Son, which is Jesus Christ. There's nothing on the inside of the Holy Spirit that is evil. And so as a result, you are now speaking an injurious statement. You are saying out of your mouth something that is injurious to the good name of God the Father. You're saying something that's injurious to the good name of the Son, Jesus Christ. You're saying something that's injurious to the good name and the divine majesty and power of the Holy Spirit. So as a result, that I could never be forgiven. But he's given this example before the Holy Spirit comes. Now why? Because there's still the aspect of them trying to redeem these teachers of religious law. So stay here and then we'll close. How could you be in a house and have somebody not teach you about this unforgivable sin? How could you be thinking that it's okay for you not to get this warning? How could you say to yourself, I'm teaching the inerrant word of God in the manner in which God will bless. And I won't give you one of the greatest warnings that you should have as a believer in Almighty God. Never speak counter and against the Holy Spirit, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're experiencing. And for me, I would add, and don't get into the habit of trying to ask for repentance and saying negative things about God the Father or Jesus Christ the Son. And don't allow people who are around you to continue to say things that are counter like that. They have to give an account for the words that come out of their mouth, but you need to have a loving enough spirit to try to tell them, man, there's a consequence to this. Don't say nothing bad about my dad, man. Real talk, you might not know the great things that he's done for me, but he's a great God because he's a good God and he's a loving God. And he loves you enough to allow you to repent of the negative things that you said. But I tell you, man, watch your mouth when it comes to the Father. Watch your mouth when it comes to the Son. But never say anything blasphemous against the Holy Spirit because it's the one sin that can never be forgiven. So with that being said, I pray that God blessed you immensely uh, with this teaching this morning. I pray that it touched you in some way and blessed you to have a greater understanding of just the inerrant aspects of the word of God and the reason why we are called and blessed to teach his word uh, and to break it down so that way everyone can receive it. So with that being said, I want to pray us out uh, and pray that our service uh, this Sunday goes amazing, that God blesses in a mighty way. Uh, I thank God for all that he's doing in this house. Uh, I thank him for all the things that he's blessing us to experience. Uh, and I ask that he continue to bless each and every one of us according to his good and perfect will. So let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we come thanking you for blessing this, your son and teacher, with a word to give to your people. God, sometimes we have uh, words that uh, won't make us shout, that won't make us jump for joy, that won't even uh, make us dance. But these are words, God, that are necessary for the edification and building of your kingdom to guard the speech of your people, God, and to bless us in a way where we will never do something that's unforgivable by you. That, God, you will bless our tongues to glorify and to magnify and to praise you, God, is why you created us. Not to ever say anything, God, that will devalue you in any capacity, way, shape, or form. So God, bless us right now with what it is that we heard to guard our minds, our hearts, our spirits, and our tongues to make sure we will always be in right relationship with you. And Father, bless every person who received that they will hear and adhere to the warning that you have provided to them this day. God, continue to watch over this, your servant, and this, your house, and all the people 
who are called believers according to our confession and our hearts. God, continue to walk with us and talk with us and bless us as only you can. Watch over the service today, God, and bless it according to your good and perfect will. Bless the word that's going to be given and bless all who are going to receive that we may be changed according to how you want us to be changed. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen. May God bless you, may God keep you, and love you one another.